My name is Diane Heron and I've lived in Manchester for most of my life. I was born in Jamaica, came to Britain as a little girl in the late 60s and I think of myself as a Mancunian, you know, Mancunian Jamaican rather than, <laughs> rather than British. So yeah, that's me, Diane Heron. I wear many hats, which, you know, hopefully we'll talk about in a little while. Okay, so my achievements and what I've done. All right. And um, my creativity involves writing. Uh, I've always written from a very young age. I've written poetry. I started off reading and then realized that, you know, I could write. And I've always used poetry to summarize, to reflect on what's happened to me. And I call poetry my therapy. So I've had two books of poetry published, and that's Contemplation, and that's, uh, that's volume one, Contemplation, and volume two. And basically, they are just my summary of things that have happened to me over the years and things that I see around me. So they're not all about me. That's my way of processing what's going on. I've also written two books of short, humorous stories about a fictional Jamaican family living in Manchester. And that's my way of capturing my Jamaican culture because they're written in standard English with Jamaican patois dialogue. And I try to incorporate a little bit of black history in each story. So each story that you read, you will know a little bit more about black history than you, know, you knew before. And that's just my way of preserving the things I remember as a little girl and my culture. Right, I was recently nominated. Um, Bex Live is an organisation that's based, I think they're based in Birmingham, and they give awards to various people in the community for the different things that they do. Um, community work, you know, nurses, writers, musicians, poets. So I was nominated for an award as um, Writer of Colour, and I was very surprised to be nominated. And I was even more surprised when I went along to the event at Wolverhampton to actually win this award. And it's um, a writer, writer of colour 2017. And as you can see, I'm grinning because I'm still, I still can't believe I actually won it. So yes, I, I won that award for my writing. And what else can I say? I'm, I'm working on book three. I've written a novel, which I'm working on. I just need to find time to edit it. So those are, those are my creative sides. Right, so as I said, I wear many hats. So yes, another side of me is um, I've been a foster carer for a private agency for about well, it's 17 years. I think I started in 2000, so it was 17 years in May. And during that time, I fostered, I think, near enough 38, possibly 39 young people. The youngest was one and a half. And I've currently got um, a teenager who's 16. He's been with me five years. And I've got a young lady who's 22. And she has a mild learning disability. And she's been living with me for 11 years. So I've cared for children, different cultures, you know, just, you know, they're, they're placed with me and they have different needs. And I've got to know them, you know, and try to meet those needs. And um, sometimes they're only placed with me for a couple of weeks and then they move on to a permanent place or they're adopted. You know, sometimes, as I said, these two that live with me now, they're in a permanent place. Yes, I, I went into fostering, yeah, because I saw a need. I spoke, I've got friends who are social workers and, you know, a lot of them were saying that um, children, African Caribbean children, Asian children, you know, were being placed with uh, British um, foster carers who tried their best but you know couldn't really meet the cultural needs of these children and at the time um, I had my daughter I was a single parent and I was just thinking you know I'd love to do something you know to, to help to do my bit um, so I decided you know to go into fostering myself just to see you know if I could make a difference rather than you know we all look at children we say oh what a shame you know somebody needs to do something but I'm a firm believer in walking the walk, not just talking the talk. So, you know, as I said, in, 20, in 2000, I decided, right, I'm gonna to start to foster. And, you know, I signed up with an agency. And my, my youngest daughter was, um, I can't remember how old she was at the time, but I just wanted to spend more time with her as well. And I, I was able to kill two birds with one stone. I was able to spend time with my daughter, take her to school, pick her up from school, and I was able to give 
you know, a home to children and meet their cultural needs as well as their physical needs. Um, what I, I found was um, I was getting phone calls from different foster carers um, who had been told by their support workers to ring me, you know, if they needed to know anything. So, oh, give Deanna a ring. You know, so I had people ringing me all the time. Um, you know, what do I do with the skin? I've, I've got this little girl, you know, and her skin is really dry and I'm not sure what to do. What do I do with her hair? You know, so I'd be giving advice, you know, about hair care, skin care, diet. Um, you know, people, they, they, they'd have um, Muslim children and weren't quite sure about halal food. You know, what, you know, where do you get the halal food from? <laughs> so things like that. And, you know, for months, I kept getting all these calls. And I just said to, the aid, to my, my support worker one day, why don't you let me come in and do some training for the agency? And she said, oh, that's a really good idea. So she went back, spoke to the managers, and they decided that I could come in and do some training for them. And I've done that for the last, the last five years. I've gone in every year and the new foster carers come in and staff come in. And I talk to them, not just about meeting the physical needs of the children, but yeah, about hair care, skin care, you know, the, the different types of hair that we have as African Caribbean people, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And, you know, you might have dry skin, you know, and the difference between having normal dry skin and possibly eczema that you need to take the child, you know, to, to see the GP about. And then again, about food, you know, not making the child feel, um, you know, excluded, cooking a meal and letting the whole family share it, you know, even once a week, once a month, you know, so that this child can feel that their culture is important, you know, and their colour is important. I say, you know, use Google, make Google your best friend and go find out about, you know, different cultures. And that's what they do. It's the activism. I don't look at it as activism. For me, if there's a need, as I say, I believe in walking the walk. Because years ago, I actually managed um, the women's refuge um, for African Caribbean women, Sojourner's House. I, I, I was the... Um, the coordinator for two years and I found a lot of the women especially if I was on a night shift or late shift they would come and they'd start talking to me and a few of them actually said you know we can really talk to you we can tell you about anything and you listen and I started talking hmm, maybe I need to get a qualification or something in counseling and do this properly so after I left there and took up fostering I decided I needed to do something you know for myself so I decided to train to become a counsellor and I did, and you know, I now I'm a qualified counsellor, I'm a um, person-centred counsellor, also a CBT therapist, and I've worked at different organisations in the community, and I actually teach next door to this centre. There, there's a, a, a programme next to Manchester Counselling Training Centre, and I teach one evening a week. I train other people who want to become counsellors, because I think a lot of people don't realise you know, a counsellor, you know, no matter how hard they try, you know, if you have somebody, you know, we, we call it UPR, unconditional positive regard, and you can have unconditional positive regard for somebody, you can have empathy, but if you've come from that culture, you know, your ancestors were slaves, there are certain things that you will just understand naturally, that somebody else, no matter how hard they try, might not. And this is what I feel, you know, there's a need for more African Caribbean, Asian cultures, um, counsellors, female counsellors, male counsellors. So if somebody goes in, you know, I want an Indian male counsellor, that person's available. I want a Nigerian female counsellor, that person is available to meet your needs and be on the same level. So that's another part of my, my achievements, trying to do something for my community in my little way. I managed the women's refuge, Sojourner's House, um, for a couple of years and then, you know, different things happening. I went into counselling, you know, um, I, w I went through a period where I wasn't actually working and I, I can't remember if it was the job centre or I can't remember how I ended up at Mushwaf. But I remember, you know, the building on the corner of Princess Road and um, I think it's, um, I can't remember if it's Moss Lane East, I just remember it being on the corner. And the first time I went there, um, as a volunteer and I met Mrs. Dakakodia and I was so impressed because she just had such presence. She was a very humble woman but you know she was just so nice to everybody and while I was there she was very encouraging because I was going through a low 
period where I was thinking, oh, I've done this and I've done that. And, you know, where do I go from here? Because it's like, you know, everywhere I go, it's like doors are closed and I'm trying to do this and it's just so hard. And I was going through a period where I was feeling a bit sorry for myself. And the encouragement that she gave me, pointing out what I'd done already, what I'd achieved, you know, and said, yes, you can. You know, like Barack Obama says, yes, we can. And I think it was watching her and seeing all the things she was doing. And I thought, yeah, I can. And that gave me the courage to then continue with, I decided to do the counseling course as a result of that. And I saw all the women coming in. I think there was a nursery. So the women would come in with their children. And you know, there were different groups where they would get encouragement and be helped to go on courses. And I was really impressed by what Mushraf was doing, you know, Mrs. Dr. Cody was at the head of that, you know, directing everybody and really making a huge difference in the community with these women who, like me at the time, were probably a bit disillusioned. So, you know, that was how I got into that. And I then went back years later when I got to my level four to qualify as a counsellor. I went back and did my placement at Mushwaf. And again, it was just so nice to give something back because of what I had got when I was in a low place, it was lovely to actually counsel some of the women who were coming in and were going through difficulties. And often, you know, we have qualifications and we do things and maybe we can get a bit big headed and a bit full of ourselves. And it was just her presence. She just had this calm, um, you know, you never felt inferior when you were around her. And she was always encouraging. She always had a good word for everybody. And that was what impressed me. She definitely was one of my role models that gave me, you know, the, the, the courage and the incentive to perhaps try a bit hard and think, OK, yes, I've done that and that didn't work. And I did that and that didn't work. But no, I'm not going to give up. You know, I'm going to do, you know, I know I'm capable of doing more. And that gave me the courage to actually continue and, as I say, finish my counselling course you know, deciding, right, I'm going to do my bit for my community. Just seeing those ladies, and it was Mrs. Dacca Cody, and there were a few other women, and seeing the women also from um, the Abyssinia Cooperative, because there were a lot of women, the women who managed the women's refuge, they were all my role models, because, as I said, you know, they were doing so much, often unpaid. And I thought, right, if they can do all of that and make such a difference to me, I need to take my turn and make a difference, you know, to somebody else. Um, yeah. Mushroff did a lot for the community and perhaps people don't realise and I always thought it was really funny and every time I say the word Mushwaf, Mushwaf, weird name but you know human must side um, you know I can't remember exactly what it stands for the, the must, must side and human women's project yeah you know that organisation that Mrs Edwards was the the um, Mrs Daka Cody rather and well, Mrs. Edwards as well, and you know, D Diane, and all those women who are part of the Abyssinia Cooperative, you know, they did so much, perhaps much more than they even realized for a lot of the women who came in, whether it was for a day, a couple of weeks, you know, just gave us basically the confidence, you know, just to carry on. Okay. As part of my achievements, and another part of, another part of me, another one of the hats that I wear, is, um, yes, presenting radio. Because again, I noticed that in the media, if something bad happens you know, to the African Caribbean community, then it's splashed all over the newspapers. But if something good happens, you, know, you wouldn't see it. So I decided that I wanted to do an African Caribbean news program where you know, I would share some of the good things that were happening locally, nationally, internationally, pertaining to African Caribbean people. So I started off, first of all, with um, its legacy now, but it was Peace FM originally. I started off with them um, doing a news program, you know, one morning a week. And it was basically, you know, researching what was going on in the local area. Then I'd go national, I'd talk about what was happening in Africa, the Caribbean, in the USA, and try and, you know, share positive things. And then in between, each news item, I'd play some of my favourite music. So it was my way of showing off. You know, I could play all my old 60s and 70s tunes, which is what I used to do. And then I left there and I worked for a little while for Hope 
FM, which is a Christian radio station. They're, they're linked to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So I worked with them for a little while, again, doing the same thing. But unfortunately, because I do so many things, you know, sometimes things overtake whatever I do and I have to say, no, sorry, I can't do this for, you know, I have to, I have to stop. So that's what happened. But at the moment, I am working for Radio Diamond and I do uh, African Caribbean, I call it the African Caribbean News Extra. And I do that fortnightly on Radio Diamond. And what I do is I said, I share news, but I try and get in some black history as well. You know, things that people didn't know. If I did a recent article on Harry and, um, you know, his newly um, engaged Meghan Markle, but I spoke about the original, the first black queen of England, which is Queen Charlotte, which nobody knows about. You know, and I researched that and I spoke about the difference that she's made to this country and the things she's brought into this country, like the Christmas tree, that nobody knows about. And those are the sort of things I try to do. Black History Month, I talk about the origin of black history. You know, it started off in America. Um, you know, Carter G. Woodson, he was the one who brought it in, Negro History Week, which was, you know, and then they changed it to a month. And then I think it was 1987, um, Ken Livingstone, and um, I think it was a Ghanaian um, analyst, um, Akiabo um, Sebo, I can't remember his name. He actually brought it into Britain as Black History Month. And, you know, that was how we started celebrating Black History Month. But as I say, just because they've given us a month, doesn't stop us from continuing for the year. You know, we don't have to promote black history in October. We can promote it for the whole 12 months. And it's not black history. History hasn't got any colour. It's our history. And that is what I always say. And I go into schools as well and do presentations. I talk about the presence of the um, soldiers from the Commonwealth in the First and Second World War, which a lot of people don't know about. You know, the, the, there was a whole squadron of, of fighter pilots, the 139 Jamaica Squadron, people never heard of. I go into schools and I teach the children about that, and I take yam and plantain and things like that in, and I give the children a chance to talk about their culture, you know, where their parents came from, where their grandparents came from, and they love it. And that's what I'd like to do a lot more of in future, go into schools. If they'll only let me come in in October, I'm happy and talk about, you know, our history. Well, I think the work that you're doing is just amazing. The fact that you are highlighting these women who have worked so hard in the community all these years, you know, and most people probably don't know about them. So I think to continue exactly what you're doing, you know, to highlight all these women who've set the stage for us you know, whose shoulders we can now stand on because a lot of the things that women today, including myself, can do is as a result of what those women did, you know, the doors that they opened for us. So that is what I hope, you know, your project will continue to do, to continue to raise the profile of these historical women, just like Sojourner Truth, you know, and then in years to come, you know, our children, our grandchildren will know just exactly what these people did in our community so that they can go to certain schools, they can get jobs and, you know, without people closing doors in front of them. Yeah. Well, there are, there are lots of things going on in the community. Um, for instance, there's a cafe on Princess Road, you know, Coffee Nubia which is like, it's just a lovely cafe where you can go to have very healthy lunch, um, you know, places like those. I'd like to see more cultural activities happening then. There are already poets and singers and people. We go along, you know, we do, in fact, I, I go along with my poetry. There's been a few things. There's another um, local gentleman, Linford Sweeney, you know, he does his historical um, presentations there. I think it's, um, you know, once a week. Um, there's a, a, a lady, a singer, she's going to be there. Um, I think it's next week she's going to be there singing. And, you know, she, she, she's such an amazing singer. And then, of course, there's Junior. You know, you go in and he's so friendly and welcoming. And the thing I love about Coffee Nubia is multicultural. It's right in the heart of a multicultural community. And you go in and you see every nationality in there, which is the way it should be. And I think this is what we want more of in our community. You know, people outside of Moss Side hear the word Moss Side and they say, oh my God, Moss Side. Whereas, you know, the people who live here, we know that Moss Side is an amazing place. And we just want more projects like yours highlighting 
the positive things in Mosside. You know, the community centres, the youth club at the powerhouse, you know, the, the community centre here, you know, the West Indian centre, all the things that go on here, the elderly groups that meet here next door, the training centre. There are lots of things that are going on in our community that maybe, you know, the wider um, community or maybe other people in Manchester don't know about and they need to know. You know, it's not just negative things, you know, that, that we do. And again, people buy into these stereotypes. Oh, you know, all black people smoke marijuana and they carry guns and knives and... Really? You know, uh, no, I know marijuana as a medicine. My grandmother used to boil it and drink it, you know, for stomach ache. It was only when I came to this country I realised that people smoked it. <laughs> so, you know, and these are all the things that people used to realise. Stop buying into stereotypes and get to know real black people. So, Deanne Heron, thank you very much for being part of the WAS project. Okay. I appreciate you being here. You are a creative woman in your own respect, very expressive, a voice that people know because they hear you on radio. Yes. They hear you around, of course, poetry readings at events, festivals, and, of course, fantastic that you won the Bex Live. That is truly fantastic. And, of course, the work that you've done fostering, you've, you've touched so many people's lives. And I bet you don't see the, all of that all the time, but that is your activism achievement and challenges all faced into one, all rolled into mm. one. No, so thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me because, yeah, often, you know, and it's not just me. There are lots of people in our community. We just get on with it. You know, we do things and we don't do it for praise. We just do it because we see a need. You know, and I'm just one of many. But it's really lovely of you to invite me, you know, on the WAS project. And I hope, you know, you continue from strength to strength and you get lots more funding and you can do far more, you know, and go international. So, you know, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.